Uh, thank you all for being here for the last panel of the day. We saved the best for last, of course. <clears throat> the uh, title of our panel is uh, Global, National, and Local Policy Solutions. So this panel will have all the answers to the questions you had today, <clears throat> which might be a tall order, but they'll at least point us in the right direction, hopefully. So um, again, my name is Kevin Appleby. I'm the senior fellow here at CMS. <clears throat> I'm just going to introduce the speakers in the order of their speaking um, and let them go. And we'll have hopefully have time for questions uh, at the end of the panel. Um, so first, we're going to go right down the panel this way. First, we have Assise Mateo, who's with the UN Migration Network, where she serves as senior policy and liaison officer. And CSA is going to talk a little bit about the Global Compact on Migration, where that is in the implementation phase, um, and what the future might hold for that, for that agreement. Um, so welcome, Assise. Um, our second speaker will be Victor Danina. Hi, Victor. Uh, the Scalabrini International Migration Network. Victor has been in the middle of the advocacy efforts around the GCM and its implementation. And he'll also talk a little bit about best practices by the Scalabrini Network in welcoming migrants uh, in the Americas. Third, we are happy to have Anna Green, who's the Senior Protection Officer for UNHCR in Washington, D.C. Um, and Anna will speak to the efforts of UNHCR globally, but specifically in the Americas and the Caribbean uh, for us. <clears throat> Fourth, we thank Katherine Anderson, who is the Deputy Chief of Deputy Chief of the Office of Policy and Strategy for the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service for being here. Catherine holds a crucial position in the U.S. government in fashioning public policy to respond to these new and emerging migration flows and will share with us what the administration has done uh, to respond to them or is doing. Finally, last but not least, you'll have the final word is Monsignor Kevin Sullivan who comes from Catholic Charities of New York. He's well known both here in New York and in Washington for his witness on behalf of immigrants and refugees. And he'll give us some insight into, as to the situation here in New York. And what I'm looking forward to the most is his perspective on the current state of our nation's immigration policies. <clears throat> so thanks to all of you. As I said, we'll have questions at the end and um, I call on a CSA to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Kevin. I'm very, very happy to to join you today uh, here. And um, as Kevin said, I have the. I, I, as I came in the room, I, I realized how the discussion was really focused on on national um, U.S. Uh, policies. <laughs> I'm now going to um, to to take the focus uh, on on the rest of the of the world. That's that's the 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 part that is incumbent to to the UN network on migration. Um, just maybe as a as a very short uh, reminder that the Global Compact for Migration is is the main intergovernmentally agreed UN framework on migration governance, uh, which builds on the commitments made by states um, in the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants of 2016, and also out of which the Global Compact for Refugees, and I'm sure Anna will speak to it emanates also from. Um, but it's key to the spirit of the Global Compact for Migration, it really is the 360 degree approach to the 23 objectives um, of uh, the migration, uh, let's say, policy spectrum. Um, and, and also what is extremely important, and it's going to be central on the work we've developed in the UN Network on Migration, is uh, that uh, there is a principle-based approach to uh, migration governance uh, that builds around uh, the, the inter interdependent guiding principles of the Global Compact uh, for Migration. These are going to be extremely important in building international cooperation on migration. Now, the Global Compact for Migration was adopted in 2018 at the very end of the year, and almost in parallel, uh, Secretary General Guterres established an interagency mechanism to service member states, but also stakeholders in implementing uh, the Global Compact. 
And since then, since the establishment of the network that is housed, let's say the, the secretariat and the coordination role is with IOM. Uh, but what we've tried to do really is to build a space for multi-agency cooperation and actually to bring the UN system together around the capacity building uh, offer we put out there for member states and stakeholders. Um, what it really means uh, and what it meant in those years is that uh, we've established the capacity building mechanism. What, what that meant uh, since 2019 is that we've established regional UN facilitation teams uh, that have as an objective to build the capacity and we've trained already 250 staff across all the UN entities involved in the UN network on migration uh, to help UN country teams integrate migration in the national development planning and to help those colleagues that sit in those UN country teams advise governments on how to integrate migration. So how to develop national migration policies on the one hand, but also how to integrate migration in the different commitments that member states take on also implementing other main UN frameworks, uh, the development so the agenda 2030 on sustainable development goals, but it also goes for how do we um, you, how do we work with migration in responding also to the commitments of the Paris Agreement and other frameworks such as the Sendai Framework for Disaster uh, Prevention, um, etc., etc. Uh, we've also put in place teams that deliver technical assistance for governments and stakeholders when they requested. And here the idea really is uh, to develop uh, tailor-made programs that responds to their needs. Uh, we've recently done it in, I'm just thinking about some examples uh, recently in Kenya that decided to develop a national implementation plan on migration or in the Caribbean community of states that is now in the process of developing a regional migration policy. Uh, we're also working with El Salvador um, and we've recently done it with Mexico or with Ghana, for example, who reached out uh, because they wanted in particular to um, get advice as to how to mobilize multi-stakeholder dialogues to inform uh, multi-stakeholder, meaning civil society partners um, and, and beyond. This involved, involved, includes also academia, but unions as well, um, local authorities, um, etc. There is actually in the Global Compact for Migration Resolution a paragraph that goes through the categories of stakeholders that are when, you know, in, in this multi-stakeholder um, word I use, uh, all these categories of stakeholders are involved. Um, with that, there was also a Migration multi partners Trust Fund that was established. Um, there is a very specific um, way of addressing um, multi-donor funds in the UN system. Um, there is a, an office that is managing that and those multi partners Trust Funds are, are dedicated either to thematic priorities or to regions. And uh, we now have one on migration, which didn't exist before. And with that, what we're really aiming and, 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 and at doing, and, and it's key to the programs we are funding through that instrument, is the interagency cooperation. These are programs that actually are of a fundamentally operational nature. Uh, it's programs that cannot be granted funding if they're not coming with a project that has several UN entities behind and uh, without the endorsement of the resident coordinator um, who is the UN chief in a country, uh, to, to, to explain that uh, in, in, in simple words. Um, this fund actually is in high demand and the 30 programs we have in the pipeline pending uh, funding is a demonstration of it. Uh, but what we, we've also tried to do with the UN Network on Migration over the last uh, four years is really to be uh, an enabler of partnerships and of dialogues, to bring member states together sitting with civil society and uh, with uh, other stakeholders um, to promote uh, best practices as well. And with that, we've also 
build uh, what, what we, we like to call a one-stop shop uh, where we hope member states and stakeholders can go to, and you can access that through the UN Network on Migration website, a policy repository uh, that now has over 270 uh, policies, 70% of which are all policies implemented at national level. So governments and stakeholders go to this policy repository and uh, what they consider to be good practices in specific areas of migration policies, they would uh, submit those practices uh, that can and uh, inform other member states in other regions as well on those. And these policies are peer reviewed before they're actually part of the repository. Um, and with that, a big part of, of the, the work with the effort we've put in capacity building really goes to uh, building the capacities of governments and of stakeholders to have multi stakeholder approaches. So we we are very mindful of, of that, even though it's it's a never ending effort because uh, civil society and multi stakeholder approaches evolve by nature and also are extremely different from one region to another one. Uh, but we have and maintain at least quarterly consultations at global level with civil society. And we also um, have uh, in all our capacity building tools for governments to implement the GCM, very specific guidance on how to involve civil society at every stage of the process of developing uh, migration policies. Um, the network is, is also um, the development of thematic guidance. Uh, and in that, uh, to really um, go through, through it, if you're interested in that, I, I would guide you to the work plan of the network that is accessible in the website. Uh, we have 14 work streams, all of which are composed by multiple UN entities and civil society as well. And the aim of these work streams really is to develop thematic guidance on specific areas covered by the Global Compact. Um, though th that guidance also informs the way we work with UN country teams and we help colleagues uh, build the capacities to work on that. And I, to mention a few, uh, the work stream on alternatives to detention has been tirelessly working to develop peer learning exercises between governments um, uh, who are interested in, in seeing how other peer governments work on alternatives to detention. Obviously, there's a lot of work to do on that area. I don't need to tell you practitioners at national level. And there is no miracle um, uh, right now, but it's it's been, we've seen progress at least in how governments engage in those dialogues and how maybe they were not engaging so much four years ago um, in those areas that they continue to consider sensitive. Um, and a couple of governments and regions have come to us to ask for support in rolling out the thematic guidance. Um, an alternative to detention, I can mention Zambia, um, but also on bilateral labor migration agreements, um, on return and reintegration. Very, very recently in, um, in Central America, a group of countries actually gathered to look at the guidance that the network developed in that regard and to try to see what are the standard and principled approach they can actually um, uh, include in their, in their policy planning. Now, maybe before I, I leave it at that, just to a, a, um, a last point on how do we assess progress? Um, that is an important question when we talk about a multilateral framework of governance. Uh, the Global Compact for Migration has in itself a section that lays down the steps and the framework to review periodically progress of implementation. And we're coming out from the first global review, uh, which is quadriennial. Every four years, there is a global review of implementation, obviously is voluntary in nature, as is the implementation of the global compact migration. And I'm sure there, there will be questions on, on that. But that part of the resolution is extremely important because it allows the document to remain a living document. Uh, it's, it's by having that that we can really move 
from one review to another one, identifying with more clarity those areas that are gaps or challenges and that can inform the future action. Um, that quadrennial review process contains also a midterm one, if, if you will, which is of regional nature. Those are the regional reviews. And after a first global review, uh, uh, which took place in 2022 in New York, there are a number of issues that, uh, that were extremely useful for the international community to, to actually come um, to. Uh, first is that obviously we had COVID, the COVID pandemic in the middle. It was something that took us all by surprise when we adopted the global compact. Uh, that didn't exist. It wasn't in the radar. Um, and, and it had, of course, a lot of implications for mobility. Um, and in the International Migration Review Forum, we actually, uh, a lot of member states uh, had the opportunity to actually um, explain how they tackled those challenges. And a lot of important practices were actually mentioned from some countries um, in some regions which actually decided to go for regularization schemes um, that who recognized that it was an important policy instrument tool um, to others also offering and thinking on, of ways of, of, of putting in place alternative or adequate documentation for undocumented stranded migrants um, and, and also a whole set of, of, of programs and policies as well that were tackling access to services, um, inclusion on vaccination programs and opening access to, to health plans as well. But it was also an important moment to, and these are important moments to actually call for more commitment. Um, and we came out from, from that um, first International Migration Review Forum with 241 pledges, um, which is important because it keeps member states who formulate those pledges committed to also look into the progress they make right in 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 those um pledges and it's a critical way to encourage reporting especially when we're talking about voluntary reporting now finally uh, and this will be my last word the international migration review forum concludes with a political declaration which was adopted by consensus um and it really wasn't nothing for a topic that is uh, sometimes agitates a lot uh governments and, and this is a General Assembly uh, resolution um, in which we also see that there are areas for future progress that are outlined uh, and that obviously needs that we continue um, this work, not least by recognizing the loss of life in transit of migrants and also all the work that we continue to be doing on that um, and um, the same for access of humanitarian assistance uh, for, for migrants. And uh, finally also to maybe um, have a set of common indicators to measure progress of implementation of the Global Compact, which is something that the resolution in itself does not contain. And these three areas uh, of work are three new mandates that the network um, uh, has coming out from that first global review and on which we are already working to um, propose uh, the this new way forward of these three areas probably and hopefully by the end of now, next year we'll we'll have those proposals in the table to continue um, the discussion on on how we progress work on the GCM implementation. Hi everyone, and uh, I would like to start by thanking Mario and CMS for the invitation, particularly Kevin for inviting me to join this panel. I'm very glad to be here and to share just some from the advocacy point of view some issues related to both the Global Compact and the, and the follow-up process that is made with the United Nations going to be the first part of what I'm going to 
to share with you. And the second part is more uh, a kind of uh, view on how in Latin America we can see a connection of the global with the regional uh, developments we are seeing that in a way as uh, was mentioned in the previous panel we can see a, a, a mixed uh, diagnosis very good things and also very negative ones that are unfolding at the same time so also in the continent in the rest of the of the continent we see this mixed scenario so to begin with i, I mean relation to uh, the global compact and uh, all the information that Asis is kindly shared with us. I would like just to, for those who are not very familiarized with the global compact, the global compact is um, a resolution. It's not an agreement because it's not like the other United Nations Convention that is binding and it creates obligations to the states that are part of this. This is a voluntary, non-binding instrument that was uh, negotiated in 2017 as a result of the Mediterranean crisis that some of you remember in 2015 with this very shocking picture of a Syrian boy who was drowned and was found in a Turkish shore. So this triggered process, especially because of the political pressure in Europe and for European states to do something about migration. And that's how in 2016 the New York Declaration was adopted and two compacts were negotiated, both of them adopted in 2018, the one on migration and the one on refugees that Anna is going to refer to after my intervention. And the issue is that the negotiation of the compact, it was indeed a very peculiar and enriching process of exchange of views and interaction. The only problem as from an advocate point of view is that it's a voluntary document. It does not create obligations. So what can you do without, apart from the political, let's say, pressure you can exercise to a country that voted in favor of this resolution. It's very difficult, but anyway, you have also the, the revisions, as Asise mentioned, every four years we have a, a forum, the International Migration Review Forum, that takes place in New York. As a result of it, you, you, you have to, I mean, states adopt a declaration as Asise mentioned, it was adopted by consensus. But many states disengage of the process. So it's not that the belonging, the ownership of the document was not shared by all the EU delegations. So that also is a message. Of course, adopted by consensus, but many states, including the US, Australia, and others in Asia, uh, disengage from the process and they stop participating in the in the negotiation of the declaration. Also, if you see the zero draft of the declaration, all the mentions to, for example, the rights of migrants and the, and, and the labor rights of migrant workers and the human rights of migrants, they were watered down along the process of negotiation. And that's why also some states felt free to, to adopt the, the resolution by consensus. So the issue is that, uh, yes, we have something at the United Nations, but the problem is that you depend on the goodwill of the governments to implement uh, what is there. So it's, in, in my view, it's more a collection of principles and in some cases practices that can be helpful for states at the national level to implement their own uh, migration and refugee policies. But the issue, I mean, we are very far away at 
the United Nations to have something that establishes some obligations to states in relation to migration issues that you have in many other issues. To be honest, it's very frustrating to do advocacy on international migration at the UN because you can see that other issues and your colleagues that do other issues, they get much more than what we get. But anyway, I will, I will leave it like that. And of course, if anybody wants to, to make Raise questions more than happy to reply to them, to respond. And um, going to the to the regional, I'm going to focus on what is happening in certain Latin American countries because the Scalabrinian congregation is a, is a Catholic congregation focused on serving people on the move, not only migrants and refugees, but also uh, fishers and seafarers. That is the main uh, objective they have. And in Latin America, we can see that thanks to the work uh, that civil society has done in close cooperation with states, you have very good cases of regularization in very large amounts. For example, in the case of Ecuador, you have half a million Venezuelans who have been regularized. In the case of Peru, 250,000, and in the case of Colombia, it's almost 2 million people or more. The problem we have is that uh, sometimes Lawyers uh, don't don't want to invest the time and effort they have to invest in order to hire uh, migrant workers, but at least you have the message that people were welcome uh, as, as an initial reaction. But also, as part of Latin America, you have very limited institutional capacity, so the burden. I mean, it's a very national governments and also the local governments. So in that, uh, in that scenario, it was fundamental to have access to international development funds in order to support this. But for example, there is a, an initiative called the RPB, which is an initiative that coordinates the efforts and activities of all the major UN agencies on this issue, which is IOM. UNHCR. And uh, with this fiscal year, they needed like 1.7 billion dollars. And by this, this moment, this very day, they have received 15 percent of this money. You can imagine, especially lacking in other international capacity, the problem we are seeing in Latin America is that these these problems are not so relevant. Of the donating countries and societies. So that is going to be a huge problem in order to consolidate and support the migration of the Venezuelans, who more or less by now they should be 7.7 million in seven different countries in Latin America, which is for very limited institutional. This is a huge problem. And also, just to make the issue in, in the best way possible to end, we have a serious problem in the recognition of the condition of refugees. There are more than 1.2 million applications for uh, refugees in the Latin American continent. For almost six years since the crisis arose, we have just 300,000 people that have been recognized as refugees in the Latin American 
and besides the institutional uh, framework is very weak. We have to many, many we have a hearing and to the documentation we can have that authorities and we have that <laughs> comments made to what all of you have been talking about as well as I think picking up on a lot of the, the groundwork that John Slocum from our association threw out on um, the different pathways. So I was asked to speak uh, in the first instance about the Global Compact for Land Refugees and I am not nearly the expert on, oh, closer, okay, yeah. I am not nearly the expert on the GCR as my two colleagues are on the GCM. Um, in part because I am in a country office in the United States and so I'm much closer to the policy and practice in the day-to-day -day, rather than big global um, big global processes. But I wanted to take a few minutes just to explain a little bit about what the GCR is for those of you for whom this is somewhat new and also to mention some of the things that I find the most exciting in the process and the way that the, um, the GCR has been developing as a practitioner who's in the UNHCR office you know really doing field work from at least in the United States. Um, so for those of you, I mean, obviously following what on Asise mentioned about the Global Compact on Migration, the GCR is obviously the principal intergovernmental framework for the coordination around addressing the situation of refugees, persons living forced displacement, as well as stateless people. And uh, I won't go into the complex architecture of the GCR process or the Global Refugee Forum process that is coming up. Um, because in part, I'm not nearly as expert as Asise is um, in the GCR, uh, but I will say, um, just in terms of the basic arch architecture, the Global Refugee Forum is coming up next month. It is held every four years and is basically a stock-taking exercise uh, to really look at what progress has been made and what gaps are still missing, um, and a really a lessons learned space for the implementation of the GCR. And it really is a space where states and civil society, including refugee and stateless-led organizations, will be coming together in Geneva in about a month um, to take stock, share lessons learned, evolve pledges that have been made, and really to continue to develop um, existing and new concrete initiatives um, taken together. And of course, the pledges are not just donor pledges, being financial also material pledges, pledges in the area of policy priorities. Um, and I'll speak a little bit in the second half of, of my remarks a little bit more about um, some of the resettlement and pathways pieces, especially as they're manifesting in the Western Hemisphere. So the pledges are not just made by states. Um, there is also a platform for multiple stakeholder pledges uh, that really complement and reinforce the state pledges. Um, the example I'll give is it's the, it's the multi-stakeholder pledge that I've been following the most closely given my work here in the U.S. is a multi-stakeholder pledge on statelessness where a very large swath of civil society groups, including national legal service providers in different countries around the world, pro bono law firms that are working on asylum from around the world, um, have come together to join UNHCR to pledge to be members of and support the building of a new next platform, the next global campaign um, in the quest to end statelessness following on the end of the I Belong campaign, which is next year. So this pledge coexists alongside um, at least 11 country pledges on uh, statelessness, most of those in Africa, but also in the Caribbean region. Um, so essentially, that's a good example of a multi-stakeholder pledge. And I would really encourage you, those of you who aren't that familiar with the GCR, and perhaps are not not attending the Global Refugee Forum next uh, next month, I know that many of you are, um, really take a look at our website and look at the state pledges and the advances made in those multi-stakeholder pledges, as well as some of the thematic areas that are being covered um, under the GR, GCR um, umbrella. Some of the most exciting work streams that I've been following very closely, aside from the resettlement and complementary way, uh, pathways, of course, which is very topical for the U.S. Office of of UNHCR. Um, there are specific initiatives related to ATDs, related to child protection, and uh, quite an important global initiative.
initiative related to the creating, creation of an asylum capacity building support group. Um, much of the asylum capacity building support group's work um, is informed by over a decade of work here in this hemisphere between the US, Canada, and Mexico, um, whereby the, um, the three countries have been working together on capacity building, and in particular, it's really been very transformative in um, the building of the modern Comar, the Mexican asylum system. So the Asylum Capacity Building Support Group aims to really try to replicate some of the better practices in that space to see how asylum countries around the world um, can gain more support um, to you know, bolster their practices and also create some resiliency um, to address some, some of the issues that my colleague Victor mentioned. Um, there's also a climate action work stream, which is very exciting. But the two work streams that I have really been focusing on following because I find they're very important. Um, one, there is a work stream that relates to digital protection and the prevention of harmful impacts of hate speech, misinformation, and disinformation, which is extraordinarily topical here in the Americas, where we have so much misinformation and disinformation um, that are received by migrants and asylum seekers on the ground. And then there's another work stream, um, which I've been following very closely, which relates to localization shifting power and elevating the voices of actual persons with lived experience in forced displacement or statelessness, and also their host communities, elevating voices within host communities. Um, so I would really encourage you, uh, those of you who aren't that familiar with the upcoming forum, to take a look at the website and, and look at the sort of architecture that's around a lot of these, a lot of these um, work streams and, and related initiatives. Uh, the final thing I'll say is that I think one area where we are making progress, I would call it slow and steady, but at least it is progress, is I, I, I feel that where I sit in a country office of UNHCR, I can see a lot of investments being made around the world in Geneva on trying to create much more space for refugee and stateless-led organizations um, in policy-making circles, in places where decisions are made, and in trying to guide donors. Um, not only state donors, governmental donors, but also private philanthropy and the private sector um, in how we invest humanitarian dollars. And um, in addition to, I would say, the usual suspects participating this year from the big international NGOs, um, we will also have more than 20 people from the United States living in the United States, either refugees, asylees, stateless persons, and, and other people experience in forced displacement, who will be representing as part of the U.S. delegation this year. And it's a pretty diverse group. Um, Afghans, Bosnians, Jamaicans, uh, Palestinian, Syrian, Iraqi, Ugandan, Congolese, Vietnamese. It's a, it's a quite diverse group of, a delegate, uh, of delegates who are representing refugee and stateless voices. So I'd really um, encourage uh, all of you who are interested to, to follow the GRF. Um, and I think that Probably after the GRF, we might have a little bit better idea of how to answer the question of what has been achieved so far. But it's definitely a work in progress. So I'll turn very briefly to the Western Hemisphere and um, relating to uh, the Global Compact on Refugees, one of the four main objectives, and one of those four objectives is expanding third country solutions. And Kevin asked me to speak about innovations and solutions. And I'm going to speak about what I know, which is the Western Hemisphere and some of the burgeoning um, either new or expanded protection pathways for refugees, um, in particular to the United States, Canada, and Spain, which is where we've seen most of the innovations in the Western Hemisphere, and particularly here in the US. I won't go into great detail about the Welcome Corps and the private sponsorship. I know that John already spoke about that. Um, I know that Catherine will also speak more about the Safe Mobility Initiative with SMOs in Guatemala, Costa Rica, Colombia, and Ecuador. Um, but I just want to mention, just as a, as a general framework of the transformative nature of some of these initiatives, um, since the first three SMOs launched in June in Guatemala, Costa Rica, and Colombia, and then the fourth uh, launched in Ecuador last month, October, yes, October, um, UNHCR and IOM have screened over 76,000 refugees and migrants for protection needs and other vulnerable migrant needs. Um, and, you know, in addition to resettlement qualifications, all, also looking for qualifications for other lawful pathways, non-protection pathways mostly, 
and UNHCR in particular has screened over 17,000 people for a UNHCR referral to the US RAP and has now submitted over 7,500 refugees. So this is a massive, massive step change in the numbers of people that we've been able to process using new modalities. Um, now, all, as all good things, they come with cautionary tales. So I wanna spend the rest of my few minutes um, speaking about uh, some of the you know, risks and um, challenges that we are trying to manage in the process of working with the US government as well as with Canadians and, and the Spanish government um, on trying to bring this massive step change to resettlement in the Western Hemisphere. Um, the first thing I'll say as a word of caution is that we really can never expect refugees to always comply with the logic of economic migration or with family-based migration. Um, I always recall the first time I ever heard Bill Relic say this from Human Rights Watch, and he said it a number of times before, and it always resonates with me. Refugee flight is complex. It's often very messy. Um, it is often, uh, you know, not planned well. And I know that we all recognize that everyone in this room, whether we're government or we're UN or we're advocates or we're implementers of humanitarian programming, you know, refugees and asylum seekers, as well as vulnerable migrants, our voices and our messaging are only one of many messages that they're receiving um, in times of, of acute desperation. So I think one thing we're trying to keep in mind as we build the Safe Mobility um, Office or the Safe Mobility Initiative um, is that we really have to keep protection at the center. We're not looking, at least not through the protection pathway of the SMOs, we're not building just another migratory path. We are really, we need to keep centered on the fact that we need to keep focusing on continuing to ensure that the most vulnerable have access to, to this platform. Um, the good news there is that as, if we are able to successfully create the efficiencies um, to process uh, you know, large volumes, that should create more resources to also dedicate to continue to strengthening the identification and making sure that they also have access uh, to these platforms, whether it's tech access, or it's language access, or it's access uh, for any other number of reasons why certain individuals may, you know, may fall through the cracks. Um, the second thing I'll say, and this will not be new to anyone that's been following UNHCR's um, work in the US in the past few years, we, are, we remain obviously very concerned about um, policies that intertwine or couple lawful pathways with harsh border enforcement. Um, and so we're, you know, really looking at um, trying to work uh, with all governments in the region to make sure that access to territorial asylum still remains a reality. Um, and I think, you know, we are pretty convinced at this stage, as I, as I know, as many of you are, that, you know, safe pathways for many people uh, does not necessarily translate into a one-to-one -one relationship with reduced uh, arrivals at our border. In fact, it, you know, if we don't design and we're not very careful with these uh, pathways, we may fuel even greater corruption, greater exploitation of the most vulnerable, greater suffering, and in fact, even greater movements of some people that you might not even have run into in the first instance. So we're really trying to work very carefully, and we've had great partners in PRM and USCIS in doing this, into trying to build a model that will continue to really focus and be protection centric um, and really study the model to determine whether we are balancing efficiency with quality and whether we're really ensuring access for the most vulnerable um, in ways that really do mitigate against um, refugees having to take dangerous journeys. Um, and I think the last thing I'll say is that I think we all recognize that short-term fixes really won't work. Um, we really need to be coupling uh, these safe mobility initiatives with um, many other initiatives that we've been talking about for quite some time. Um, and I won't go into detail because time is of the essence, but really looking at safe mobility initiative as one of a puzzle that involves stabilization of refugees in the first countries of asylum and really creating the livelihoods and the education and health opportunities, the access to rights and the social integration and belonging so that people do not feel that they need to take dangerous journeys after they've found refuge in the first country of asylum, strengthening asylum systems uh, along the route, as I mentioned, um, and also uh, going to what Victor was talking about, 
going beyond asylum systems and really looking at complementary forms of protection in all of these countries. Um, for example, what we've seen with Colombia and TPS, certainly not perfect, but a very important um, policy tool within that environment to help stabilize people's legal um, situation in the, you know, in the face of an asylum system that is not really designed to, to meet uh, the volume that um, Colombia is currently coping with. A large scale expansion of third country solutions, of course, goes hand in hand with this. But, you know, as I'll loop back to the, to what I said before, really ha making sure that all of those things are really going hand in hand with policies and practice that continue to guarantee access to territory and access to asylum and due process for refugees and asylum seekers once they arrive. Um, so I will leave it there. Um, and turn it over to Catherine. Thank you, Anna. Um, I'm Catherine Anderson. I'm the Deputy Chief of the Office of Policy and Strategy at U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, so situated within the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and I'm just so glad to, to be able to be here to kind of help close out the, the afternoon and really share some of what USCIS is doing to develop policies uh, to address the, the really large number of people on the move, uh, many of whom have been forcibly displaced. Um, it's nice to, to look around the room and just see many familiar faces. I know that, that USCIS, um, we've really partnered with, with many of you and your organizations to think about creative solutions uh, and, and really work toward, oh sure, sorry, better? Uh, really work toward some, some very shared goals. Just to, to situate my office a little bit before I get started within the broad uh, government bureaucracy, um, our Office of Policy is within Citizenship and Immigration Services. Uh, we have about 160 people doing policy in our office. It's really grown over the years. Um, and we develop and advise on implementation of kind of the broad range of, of policies uh, within USCIS. And we also run a lot of the regulatory development for Citizenship and Immigration Services as well. Um, we've really been working on developing policies that promote access and fairness and inclusivity um, and really trying to break down barriers to people trying to access uh, lawful immigration pathways. So I heard in, in the last panel uh, the note that we're in a very complicated time in immigration. Um, I, I couldn't second that more as I, I sit here and speak from the U.S. government perspective. Um, and I think if you saw my notes as I've been listening to the conversation and drawing arrows and making kind of last minute amendments, I think it's very, very clear how complicated things are right now. Um, in the last few years, I mean, we've seen multiple humanitarian crises uh, that we've needed to respond really quickly to. Uh, Afghanistan, Ukraine, Venezuela, uh, now the Israel-Hamas conflict. Um, and a lot of these crises have really resulted in, in large scale displacement. I think uh, I won't be the first to say this, and I certainly won't be the last. I've already heard it here uh, this afternoon. Um, but as a, a U.S. government, we have very limited tools um, to address uh, large-scale displacement in a very fast uh, manner. Um, and so we've really tried to be creative, to, to work within the framework and with the tools we have, um, but that's not a long-term solution. Uh, I certainly can't provide the, the, the certainty and um, the, the solutions that we need um, long term, we need legislation for that. For USCIS, one very critical challenge has been really balancing uh, working quickly to devote resources to and develop solutions uh, to these crises while still trying to maintain our uh, standing ongoing business, right? We, we process naturalization applications. Um, we give permanent residency. We process employment authorization documents. All of that is critical uh, to keeping our immigration processes working, uh, and we've really had to devote a lot of a lot of staff and thought and time to to responding to these crises. And so, really trying to balance uh, resources and and um, keep our critical work moving while responding uh, is certainly something that we're we're facing at USCIS as one of our challenges. I think with that, we've really been trying to um, think about longer term solutions. How can we systemically build in some flexibility and capacity to address displacement and, and large scale crises? Because unfortunately, I think we know that um, these aren't one offs and, and these will continue. So how can we address that on a, on a more systemic basis? 
So what have we been doing? I think on the previous panel, you heard some of this, so I won't, I won't rehash what's already been said, um, but I did want to delve into to some of what, what we've been doing in order to respond to, to large-scale displacement. Um, we have really been leaning into some of these regional solutions. As part of the commitments made at the LA Declaration on uh, Migration, we've uh, continued our strong commitment to welcoming refugees. We've pledged to resettle 35,000 to 50,000 uh, refugees from the Western Hemisphere during this fiscal year, uh, and have maintained the, the refugee ceiling of 125,000. And this is a target that we're very committed to meeting. Um, the refugee pathway is a lawful pathway. It is set in statute. We're committed to, to really using that to, to the full extent that we can. Um, Anna spoke some about the, the SMOs. Um, we announced the establishment of these safe mobility offices, although actually I think we announced the establishment of regional processing centers, uh, and then they became secure mobility offices, and now they're safe mobility offices. Uh, there's still, I think, an ongoing debate about whether we call them SMOs or SMOs. Uh, I think we go with SMOs. I heard you say SMOs. Uh, either one is fine. Um, and to top that all off, they're not even all offices. Uh, some of this is done virtually. Um, and so really, it's probably more appropriate to talk about it as an initiative as opposed to a series of offices. Um, I've been very involved in, in the SMOs. It's something that I could probably spend an hour talking about. Um, I won't delve into all of those details. Um, but it is a, a new thing that the administration is trying with any new thing. You know, you're trying to work it out. There's a lot of room for growth, but it is something that we're, you know, we're really very excited about. Um, you know, the underlying theory is that there are a variety of lawful pathways. We've done a lot to expand those lawful pathways. And the earlier in the journey that we can connect people to the pathways that might be appropriate for them, the better for everybody. Um, and this is on, I think, you know, the positive side if someone has a pathway, let's screen, let's identify what might be the best fit so that it's not a smuggler advising on whether someone might be eligible or not. Um, and let's get them into that pathway. We're doing very fast uh, refugee processing at the SMOs, uh, really building on the model that we've been using in Qatar uh, for Afghan refugees, doing multiple steps of the refugee process concurrently. Uh, that's been going well so far. We're going to continue to, to try to uh, move these cases very quickly and make it a real viable, fast pathway. Um, but if somebody isn't eligible for a pathway to the United States, the theory is let's let them know sooner rather than later, again, so that you don't have a smuggler uh, telling somebody that they will be eligible for something that they're not. Um, you know, we are at the SMOs uh, working very closely with, with UNHCR and IOM to screen for a broad array of pathways. Um, we have the protection pathway, as Anna mentioned, um, so many people may qualify for, for refugee status. I think one of the things we've really recognized is people uh, are, it's difficult to self-identify in many instances as a refugee. Uh, I think you heard earlier, you know, defining particular social group is, is quite a challenge, even for us experts in the asylum space. And so asking or expecting someone to identify uh, that they may fit within a particular social group um, is, uh, is, not realistic. And so again, one of the services provided at these centers is someone may not identify as even needing protection, but they might actually fit uh, within a particular social group or other um, you know, identified protection need. That piece is going. I think that piece is going well. We want to continue to grow it out. Um, we're also screening for family reunification pathways. Um, that's going. Not everyone will have a family member in the United States to have that be a pathway for them, but, but many people will. I'll say a piece of the, the SMO process that we're really still trying to, to build up are labor pathways. I think we recognize that many people are looking to come to the United States to work. Um, you know, we want to give access to those pathways. We're uh, more limited than I'd like in the, the labor pathways to the United States, to be honest. Um, but we're looking at ways that we can provide access, give information, and really even build in third country pathways um, for other countries that may have uh, labor regimes that may be more flexible or someone may qualify for. So the idea is really to have this be a one-stop shop that someone can come to uh, on their journey or even before they start their journey and um, have pathways identified for them. We do recognize that not everybody will have a pathway to the United States, um, working again very closely with our UNHCR and IOM uh, partners to look at local integration options or again really trying 
in kind of third country pathways. Um, so see, I did go on and on about SMOs. But anyway, we're very excited about the potential. I think there's a lot more to be done there. Um, and that's really something that we want to continue, continue to build out there. Um, you heard on the last panel quite a bit about some of the various uh, parole-based innovations uh, that this administration has put in place. Again, I think some of these uh, crises that we've had to react to very quickly have really pushed the bounds for us in terms of innovation uh, in a really positive way. Um, you know, I think you saw that um, initially with the response to uh, Afghanistan. Um, we need to move very quickly uh, to address the situation in Ukraine as well. Um, you know, with that, we had a very efficient parole process that we built out using sponsorship um, within the parole context, really, in this way on a large scale for the first time. Uh, that did lead to you know, using a similar process for uh, Cuban, Haitian, Nicaraguan, and, and Venezuelan migrants. Um, and it's, it's just really been interesting to see the, um, the incredible outpouring of support and willingness uh, to sponsor uh, migrants that Americans have put forward. As you uh, heard, especially for what we're calling the CHNV parole processes, uh, you know, the, the interest has far outstripped the 30,000 monthly slots. Um, you know, we continue to try to use uh, as many of those 30,000 monthly slots as we can, um, but you know, unfortunately we are limited by that, by that cap. Um, I think just in terms of sharing some of the numbers um, for Uniting for Ukraine, which is the parole response for Ukrainians, um, the most recent numbers I saw are that 165,000 Ukrainians have come through that process already. It's a very fast and efficient process for us. Um, and under the, the CHNV parole processes, as of the end of August, there have been over 211,000 uh, Cuban, Haitian, Nicaraguan, and Venezuelan nationals and their family members who have come through that process. Um, so we continue to, to use those pathways. Um, I think I heard in the last panel about the family processes being shrouded in secrecy and mystery. That's not our intent, I'll say that. I'll try to shed some light on those and I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, these are processes we very much would like people to use and are trying to get information uh, out about them. Uh, they are processes that are being screened for through the SMOs. Uh, and so we are identifying some people who may be eligible uh, for these processes that way. We're sending out invitations to people who have approved uh, family-based immigration petitions, I-130s, uh, so that they can access the process. And we've really tried to make the process uh, fast and efficient. Uh, the application is free. Uh, so this is a pathway that, that we very much want to use. Um, we've established new family reunification parole processes for Colombians, Salvadorans, Guatemalans, uh, Hondurans, and Ecuadorians, as well as modernizing the existing uh, Haitian and Cuban processes as well. Um, I can say these, these processes were just uh, rolled out within the last several months. Um, we have sent out invitations uh, for the totality of these uh, processes that would cover over 50,000 uh, beneficiaries. So not 50,000 invitations, but including family members, um, it would cover over 50,000 individuals. You know, it's up to the person who receiving the application whether they want to um, apply or not. Um, but so far we have almost 5,000 the I-134A is the, is the form, uh, but we have almost uh, 5,000 of those approved so people can move to the next stage in the process. Uh, and we are starting to see the arrivals. We've seen uh, over 500 arrivals so far under these new and modernized processes. Um, just briefly, like I said, we do recognize that kind of a protection or human, humanitarian pathway may not be the, the right pathway for everybody. We are very much looking at uh, labor-based pathways as well. Um, and so just to note that we have uh, continued to use uh, set-asides for H-2Bs, country-specific set-asides. Uh, so last fiscal year, we had 20,000 H-2B uh, non-agricultural seasonal worker slots uh, set aside for Northern Central American country nationals as well as Haitians. Um, and we issued over 23,000 uh, visas to nationals in these countries uh, last year. Um, really trying to balance expanded use of H-2As and H-2B visas uh, with greater protections for workers. Uh, we have published notices of proposed rulemaking uh, for both of those programs, H-2A and H-2B, which really try to expand access while at the same time promoting protections for workers. 
I think you heard in the last presentation the, the long list of TPS countries. Uh, so I won't go back through that list, but just to say that is uh, uh, um, a statutory uh, protection that we have really leaned into. I think there have been eight new countries designated for TPS under this administration. And um, we've extended and, and redesignated, expanding the eligible populations for, for many of the countries that were already designated as well. I'm going to quickly highlight two other initiatives that we've really been uh, focused on at USCIS. One relates to just the intersection of migration and climate change. I think this conversation is um, honestly probably at an earlier stage than it really should be within the US government and probably within. Um, all of our conversations. I think this is very real and I think there are a lot of challenges in figuring out what to do in this space. Um, but we are focused on, on thinking about it very much, um, really looking at how the intersection of you know, climate change may impact temporary protected status designations, um, as well as really looking at how climate change may play into asylum or, or refugee adjudications and updating our lesson plans. Uh, and training for our officers uh, to have them take some of those things into account. Um, and then Hannah mentioned statelessness, but we've also been doing some work on statelessness within USCIS. On October 30th, uh, we have a new statelessness policy that went into effect. Uh, and we really looked across our agency and realized that we didn't have a centralized way of um, trying to assess if somebody is stateless or not. And that's a very significant thing that impacts a lot of our different uh, people immediately think of refugee and asylum adjudications, but of course it impacts um, uh, temporary protected status as well, uh, adjustment of status. And so we developed, a, we're, we're just kicking off, uh, but we're developing a unit that will have specialized expertise in making statelessness assessments in order to inform the, inform the various adjudications. Um, and really trying to get more information out to the public about how uh, certain forms of relief may be available somebody is stateless, including uh, parole in place and deferred action. Um, before I stop, I do want to make sure to highlight that we recognize that uh, USCIS's work definitely does not stop once a migrant enters the United States. Uh, we have been spending a considerable amount of time over the last uh, month or even longer thinking about how to get employment authorization documents into people's hands uh, faster. Um, we realize it is, it is very important that once somebody is here, they need to immediately be able to support themselves, support their families. Um, so, you know, we have been looking in particular, um, certainly at asylum application based uh, EADs, and those are moving fairly quickly already, but trying to keep those moving quickly. Um, there is, you know, the statutory 180 day waiting period that we can't do a lot to overcome, but once people hit that mark, we're trying to adjudicate those quickly. As you've been hearing, you know, we have many people coming in on parole that you know, uh, are, are kind of pathways that have not previously been used quite to the same extent. So we've really been looking at trying to decrease our EAD processing times for people who come in through CBP-1, through the CHNB parole processes, really trying to do our best to get those down to a 30-day medium processing time um, and working very much on TPS-based uh, EADs as well. It's one thing to make a TPS designation, um, but if you can't get somebody the protection that they're qualified for and their work authorization, uh, it doesn't do them a lot of good. Um, because I'm sitting here in New York, I you know want to note we have been working very closely with the city and the state uh, on uh, EADs, and the engagement has really been happening at the, the highest levels there. It's something that we're very open to, to listening to recommendations and hearing solutions and, and, and partnering on. Um, We've similarly been looking at our naturalization processes. Again, how can we break down barriers to access? Um, and I'm going to wrap up in 30 seconds and basically just say that, um, you know, I heard a lot of questions for USCIS in the, the last um, session. Uh, I think I touched on some of them, but I'm certainly happy to, to kind of um, answer questions that, that relate to USCIS as we wrap up this panel. So with that, I'll well, listen, thank you all very much. Listen, thank you all very much. Um, congratulations to the 50 of you who lasted for the entire day. And as I can see you all out there, there are at least five of you that are still awake. So thank you very much for, for that. And the reason I'm an expert at that is because probably most of the congregation falls asleep 
when I begin to preach. So that's it. The other thing I want to tell you that we don't have to worry. It's only two and a half minutes to five o'clock. So at five o'clock, you can begin drinking. Okay? So listen, I've been very happy to listen to all of these incredibly smart people knowing all of these things. And seriously, I mean, I learned a tremendous amount today. I don't have half the um, ability to talk about things in the way that they do. So all I want to talk to you about is cakes, cocktails, and construction. That's what I want to talk to you about. Because at the end of the day, from a local perspective, that's what matters with all of these nice things you've talked about. And are some more of those things? Those are the things you do on a, on a, on a, on a fire where you take the s'mores, right? Okay, so that's it. So anyway, but, but, but it's about cakes, cocktails, and construction. So it's about this woman who came here last September. And by October, she had begun a baking business. So much so that our board of trustees at Catholic Charities, they ordered Christmas gifts for their relatives from this woman who was here only a month, who figured out that she could make a living doing that. That's what all of the things you talk about at the end of the day is about. Whatever you want to call it, processing, all of those things. It's about somebody being able to live and make it here. And I also want to talk to you about cocktails, because one of the other um, asylum seekers, came to a suburb of New York City and was working as checking cooks. And all of a sudden, one night, the bartender wasn't there. And the other didn't know what to do. And she raised her hand. She said, you know, back in Venezuela, I was a bartender. He gave her a job as a bartender. She got that job permanently. And of course, she uh, and <clears throat> within six months, she was enrolled in a community college, and she was getting set to graduate from that. She will in a year and a half. She was able to make it here as a construction. I, when I walked into our building in Midtown Manhattan, and we had 2,000 asylum seekers show up at our front door, between June 15th and August 15th, asking for 2,000. I would say hello to them on the way in. What they always ask me is, can I get a job? And we do work organizing day laborers. And this guy brought a bunch of his friends to one of the paradas in the Bronx. Some others went to the parada in Yonkers. And within three weeks, they were getting jobs as day laborers. So all of the good policies that we've been talking about all day, at the end of the day, have the end of making sure that people who migrate, either because they're forced to migrate or they choose to migrate, is they can make it in their community. So at the end of the day, it's about it's about bartending, and it's about construction, and 20 other types of jobs that people can get where they feel secure, where they can feel that they're living in a certain amount of dignity. And that's what all these policies are about when it comes to those of us who are working for them. Let me say one other thing about decompression strategy. It is needed, it's a problem. Because you know what it means at the end of the day? We use those fancy words. It means you can't let people do what, you, what they want to do. Because that's what it means. It means you've got to establish a way whereby people are going to, in an orderly way, go to different places so that they can provide for themselves so they can be fully can, can receive this. Absolutely necessary from our perspective. In New York, but where do you see it run that feeds into some of the problems when some of the lawyers got all 
mitigate that people are not go wherever they want, whenever they want, because there's a decompression strategy to make it put away way to be necessary. But that's where we have to kind of balance as a society, people having the freedom to move wherever they want to move, but yet communities having the ability to receive people in an orderly and in a way that respects the dignity of the receiving communities and the dignity of the people who are coming, coming there. And the only final thing I will say is, so often we talk about immigration policy, and we talk about what the law should be, what government should be, and we need to, because that's a critically important factor. But this is a societal issue. It's not a government issue. It's what are the intermediary institutions of society do? What does business do? What do nonprofits do? What does labor do? What do families do? We need to look at the issue of migration as a societal issue and not only focus on what government is going to do. Obviously, government has, is an indispensable part of that. But it's not the only issue. Certain jurisdictions, whether they be Texas, whether they be New York, have framed this as a government issue, not a government issue. It's all of us politics as a society, how do we respect the dignity of each person, and how do we together be a welcoming and integrated that respects everybody's dignity, their need for security, and their need for strong will in their new home. Thank you so much. Thank you, Monsignor, for your words and for waking us up. <laughs> Um, we have about 10 minutes, I think, for questions. Uh, I had one or two, but I'm going to defer to the audience so they can ask their questions. So if you have questions, and we have a microphone over there. Sorry, I was looking down. Go ahead. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. I'm kind of half brain dead. Um, my name is Stephanie Ortega. I am a senior paralegal at Kids in Need of Defense. Um, and I'm going to touch upon a, kind of a few topics that were talked about in several panels. Um, in the last panel, we heard a little bit about children not seeing futures in their countries of origin, specifically in Central America. And to that, we are seeing current trends with unaccompanied minors being... Um, I guess, victims of child labor exploitation. And around policies, I like the ideas that I heard today in this panel about protection needing to, uh, needs to be centered in policymaking and also just being mindful of not adding to grateful, uh, greater exploitation. And so I guess, is there discourse on reevaluating greater protections in policy for US, for unaccompanied minors after they've been released um, and not just people who are on the move? That's my question. Uh, a really great question. Um, I don't want to speak for HHS. Uh, I think you know, really, they're they're mostly focused on what those policies would be after someone is released. Um, but I do want to highlight one thing that we are talking about, and one I think real big challenge that we have um, at USCIS is is related to unaccompanied children. And and when we're designing these pathways, you know, I mentioned we're really talking about, um, you know, in order to prevent uh, kind of irregular migration. We're really focused on developing pathways that are easy to access and fast. And in many cases, you know, what we've designed is a process that doesn't require an in-country interview, whereas that had been required for many of these processes previously. And it's actually been a real challenge to think about how that relates to unaccompanied children. Um, because while we certainly understand that many children need to leave their country and they're not in a safe situation there, you know, there are so many more considerations and protections that we need to put in place when we think about children migrating to the United States. Um, I won't pretend to have the answers, but I just wanted to highlight, you know, that's something we've really been thinking about is some of these very efficient processes, you know, don't translate uh, well to providing the protections needed for children. And so we've really been thinking about how can we modify some of those 
um, in a way that that allows the pathway for children, but but you know builds in the protections that are needed. I could add to that as okay. well, if, unless there's another burning question. Yeah, we've. Um, it's ironic uh, because a lot of the work that we've done around this, we've done together with Kind, uh, so <laughs> kudos. Um, but I, I would say that we've had a tremendous amount of receptivity with the Biden administration to looking at pathways for children. The children are unaccompanied children are not um, processed in the SMO model in the Safe Mobility Initiative, but we have done a lot of work. Um, with children who are moving up towards the U.S. border, and as well as with some unaccompanied children who are here in the United States for whom a different country, whether it be Canada or a country in Europe, for example, might be the better option for them in terms of their long-term stability and reunification with a parent or relative who might be able to take care of them. We've been doing, this is not work that's as, these are not big numbers, but we're really trying to look at when there are children on the move, um, really looking at, you know, maybe five years ago, if a child was, um, let's say, uh, taken into custody by the child protection authorities in Mexico, um, what did the Mexican government looked at? The Mexican government looked at, could they repatriate the child? And if they could not, how would they keep them in Mexico and how would they keep them safe? Well, if that child's parent is in the United States or that child's tia is in Canada, then that child is going to move unless you basically detain them, which is illegal under Mexican law. So we have been looking very carefully at this issue. What, how do we respond and create intergovernmental, interagency processes uh, to help children reunify with looking at the best interest of the child? Um, and is it really in their best interest to go home? Or is it their best interest to stay where they are? Or is it their best interest to go to a third country? And those processes are not necessarily happening under the traditional framework of resettlement. Thank you, Diana Barnes from Skidmore College. I teach U.S. Mexico border studies. Thank you very much, really fascinating. Uh, mentioning the visas, it just made me question what mechanism may be in place that's preventing an increase in H2A, H2B visas because they're really we have an aging labor force. We have a labor shortage. We had, what, 800 and some remains found in the desert, people crossing irregularly this year, 2022. And with a shortage of those visas, would it make sense? And also to provide year-round visas. I'm thinking of dairy farm workers who are encouraged to be here and work illegally. Um, would it make sense to create, an incre create a year-round visa? and also increase the caps on the H2A, H2Bs? Yeah, no, great, great questions. Um, I mean, I think one of, I'm sure you're familiar with this, right? But I mean, one of the limitations is there are uh, caps placed by Congress on the H2Bs. Uh, so certainly, I think many have advocated for an increase in the caps. And, you know, we do get kind of, we got a recently a supplemental allocation of additional visas. Uh, we have used some of those country-specific set-asides for some of those supplemental visas. But, you know, certainly I think you, you make a really good point that the need and demand here in the United States is greater than the number of H-2B visas. Um, on H-2A visas, you know, they're, they're uncapped, so there's a lot more flexibility there. And I think the administration has been doing quite a bit to work with countries to develop those pipelines. You know, I think you have very established pipelines for H-2As from Mexico, um, and from some other countries, but it's it's new for other countries, and that's something that we've really been working to develop. We've started to see increases, but I think there's there's more to be done in that space. And then year-round visas for dairy farm workers, for example. Yeah, no, good good question. I don't have a specific uh, answer to that, but I think that's something. I mean, I think anything we can do that doesn't require legislation is something to explore. Um, and I would really have to kind of dig into that one a little bit more. But so, good question. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have one last question. I'm going to use my prerogative. Uh, it's for Cisse, Victor, and Anna, most likely, but anyone can answer. So on the GCM and GCR, <clears throat> they're non-binding agreements, right? And you're trying to gouge progress through pledges, through four-year annual review. But there's a lot of bad things happening by governments that signed on to, this, to these agreements. My question is, how do... How do your agencies, but how do, how do advocates hold countries accountable 
for what they're doing. And not to answer my own question, the State Department has this report called the TIP report, Trafficking in Persons report, and they grade countries on how they're doing on human trafficking. And it has a little bite to it. I mean, it's bad PR for the, for the countries. Is there anything out there where there's a report made on progress that's being made on these, on these instruments? Or is that something that should be left to the advocates in each country to do? I mean, how, how, do you, how do you hold the countries accountable if it's voluntary, voluntary reporting, and it's not binding? What's the best practices that you would suggest there? Yeah, I'll, I'll start by saying I do not have the answer. All I know is that the 1951 Refugee Convention and the architecture around it is significantly different than the human rights treaties and sort of the accountability mechanisms that are available. Um, I think we have many, many ways and means of trying to influence and support and persuade and you know criticize behind closed doors, sometimes criticize publicly, um, we're involved in strategic litigation in many, many countries around the world, supporting advocates. The ways and means look different. I personally do, do not despair over the lack of more teeth in the system because maybe it's I grew up in the system and I'm used to it and I get what I get and I don't get upset. I don't know. But, um, but it's, you know, the refugee regime is built differently and it's not built for that type of, um, that, stick accountability. So I, I, I don't know, maybe Asize has a better answer than that, but. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And, and maybe it'll, it'll go more or less in that direction as well. Um, it is a significantly different architecture. Uh, these are frameworks that cannot be compared with conventions. Which is not to say that all the body of international human rights law is actually not part of those frameworks, because those frameworks actually reinstate um, that all of the member states um, have those commitments. Nobody is forgetting those commitments. Uh, what these frameworks try to do is actually to give some coherence into all those commitments that are human rights commitments that apply to both refugees and migrants. That's clear, just to be clear about that. Now, it's true that by being a voluntary um, implementation, the way we work is fundamentally different because what we try to create constantly is a virtuous circle of implementation, which is not to say that this is something that is floating on air. Every time that we work with colleagues working at national level using the Global Compact for Migration or uh, for refugees, um, what happens is ultimately this is translated into national policies, right? What we're trying, what we're doing with colleagues working in UN country teams is to help them and to give them the means to advise governments on how to translate these frameworks into national policies. That is concretely what's happening. And then there is this other dimension, which is governments having the opportunity to commit and constantly formulate pledges that most most of, I mean, their pledges are of very different nature and actually Anne went uh, in, into, into that uh, detail. But for example, if we look at the 240 pledges that were formulated at the International Migration Review Forum, 70% of those were actually national commitment on national policies. Um, so this is very real. So we may not see, um, how to say this, um, it, like the the obligations in terms of the United, and actually it, it also implies a, in a way also a, a bit of a different governance being put in place, right? It's not the United Nations sitting in New York telling to everyone what they need to do. This is about engaging governments um, and civil society as well in those countries to actually be able to use these frameworks as an advocacy tool. And this has been happening. Um, the civil society can use those uh, frameworks and the involvement of the governments in those frameworks to actually remind them of the commitments they have formulated that do have national implications um, uh, in, in that, in that uh, regard. 
I hope that answered. Well, I mean, from the advocacy point of view, we see things a bit different. Think of uh, the, I mean, the two main tragedies worldwide that publicized this year. 40 people were burned alive in a migratory station in Mexico. It was huge. I myself made an intervention at the United Nations. One day later, a very high official of IOM was there. I was even praised by her. And what happened to, to the person in charge of the migration uh, centers in Mexico? He's still on the job. I mean, nothing happened. Think of what happened to this uh, boat of migrants that sank in the Mediterranean. They think it was between 500 and 600 people who died. Nothing happened. Precisely, the global compacts were designed, or one of the intentions was to prevent these kind of tragedies. That's why I, I mentioned in my intervention the shock created by the picture of the boy who died and was found in, the, in a Turkish shore. Well, in the last three years, we have had more deaths of migrants than any, in any other year. There is an initiative uh, from I, IOM that counts the death migrants in the world. Well, uh, we have right now, since they started counting, I think, in 2014, I think. Well, in the last uh, five years, it's when you can see the curve spiking. And now we have, in this very, let's say, meticulous, but also very uh, conservative, a database we have more than 60,000 people dead. Migrants are dying in larger numbers than in the previous years, even before 2015. So we have the compacts, but the numbers are telling you that these instruments or these documents, because they are not instruments of international law, are not closing the protection gap migrants deserve. And, uh, I mean, it's 550, something so. We have all to go to the gala. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. We have a lot of work to do there. Um, let's thank all our speakers for their contributions and <laughs> hand it to Mario for a quick wrap up. Yep. 30 seconds. Uh, to introduce the fact that now we'll do 45 minutes of sharing. Is that something? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, thank you all. Thank you to this panel. Um, thank you, Monsignor Sullivan, for sort of closing us on, on what is, in fact, on the ground uh, before us every day. Much appreciated. So again, a lot of work to do on a lot of issues, whether it's examination of climate issues, asylum seekers, root causes, processing protection claims, advocacy. But most of all, we need to do a better job of communicating and educating um, around the core values that I think came out today, which are very ecumenical, right? Love, home, family, and most of all, resilience. Um, so. So see you next year. Uh, two big things that we have to deal with next year for the conference. A, it'll be the 60th anniversary of CMS and IMR. And B, it'll be an election year. So we'll have to figure that one out. But until then, for those of you who are going next door for the gala, for, uh, I guess, cakes and cocktails, <laughs> we'll see you there. Thank you for coming. Much appreciated.